Ready, Natalie? Oh, yes. Welcome back to Brant Mystery Happy Hour. Woo! Nathan, what are you drinking? Well, this week I have a shot of gin, half a shot of blue carousel, and then I topped it up with some tonic water and put a splash of lemon. And I call this the Blue Freeman. And Freeman was one of the defense lawyers in the John Anderson case. Natalie, what are you drinking? I am basically drinking the same thing, but with vodka. And so mine is called the habeas corpus, which was a legal term used in that John Anderson case. So this week, we are going to take you on a little tour of a little bit of Brantford's black history and also talk about the John Anderson case. Cheers! Cheers! Okay, Natalie, so let's say we were in early Upper Canada. What is the state of slavery and like the slave trade back then? Right, so this is important because you have the transatlantic slave trade going on. So you have slaves coming from Africa, uh, sort of hanging out in England for a little bit, and then they would be shipped across the Atlantic, which was kind of known as the Middle Passage. And that's how they would get to the colonies. And so in Upper Canada, uh, there was there's obviously a history of slavery in Canada. So it, Canada is not always known as the promised land. Uh, but in 1793, uh, Lieutenant uh, Governor John Graves Simcoe tries to pass in Upper Canada the anti-slavery laws, which basically, it didn't abolish slavery, but it limited uh, the amount of slaves that were coming into Upper Canada and who was technically a slave. And so that sort of gave the political context as in um, the British Empire, conversations about abolition were starting to pick up. As far as Brantford goes, Lewis Burwell, famed land surveyor of the Brantford area, actually lists a couple of properties that were owned by black individuals in Brantford on one of his maps that he made in May 1833. This is significant because slavery was not abolished till later on August 1st, 1833 throughout the entire British Empire. Okay, so who are some of these early black Brantfordians that are on Burwell's map? For example, there was James Anderson who was on lot number one north of Stalusi Street. He was a blacksmith. Then Adam Atkin occupying number one south side of Darling Street. John Bolliston who was another blacksmith. John Van Patter whose father was a slave of Joseph Brandt. And Samuel Wright who was a barber who, and lived on the south side of Colburn Street in a log cabin. Some other black people also lived at Tuscarora and Onondaga, but really it's important to understand that early Brantford had a thriving black population in its early beginnings. Okay, Natalie, I heard a rumor that Joseph Brandt had slaves. It's true. Tyan Danega, or as we know him as Joseph Brandt, actually did uh, have a couple of slaves. So he, especially when he lived in the Mohawk village, so one of these enslaved people um, was by the name of Sophia Pooley. And so Sophia Pooley was born in Fishkill, uh, New York in 1765. And so when they came up following uh, the American Revolutionary War, uh, Sophia came with them. And so she actually wrote a memorial where she sort of recounts her time spent uh, with the Brandt family. Uh, she was eventually sold in 1807, uh, around the time of Brandt's death. But during the time that she spent with the family, uh, Brandt's third wife was actually really abusive and almost killed her at one point. And so, but he sort of defended her and uh, the fact that she was like, in the household and, and her worth. And so uh, it's really interesting because especially with early Bradford, we have this complex history of white settlers, uh, the Haudenosaunee uh, people and Six Nations and uh, also early black settlers as well. Okay, that's one slave, but surely he had more. He did. He actually had another one by the name of Prince Van Patten. And so Prince was actually noted to be in the Brandt residence almost as early as 1796. So he's here really early, right? And so 
Prince actually plays an important role in a land dispute after Joseph Brandt's death. So there is this super early settler family headed by this guy, Edie Birch. You know, the Birch Track or Birch Road out by Mount Pleasant. Anyways, Edie petitions for 200 acres of land on July 11th, 1800 from Joseph Brandt and gives him some land out by Newport, which was then called Birch's Landing or simply The Landing. Edie Birch dies in April 1812, but his son Abbasalam is around and takes care of things. Abbasalam is all fine, but when Lewis Burwell shows up, there's some confusion about Brant's infamous 999-year leases. Okay, so how does Prince get involved with this land dispute with the Birches then? So he hears about this and he ends up swearing an oath uh, to Burwell. And so when he, what he said, he was like, I was there. Uh, I remember when Captain Brant uh, gave that parcel of, or talked about giving that parcel of land to Birch. And so uh, Edie Birch did haul board to the Mohawk village for the building of the Mohawk church in payment for the said parcel of land. And he was also like, I remember Captain Brandt purchasing a large ox from Edie Birch for provisions of Six Nations. And that value was taken in Captain Brandt in payment for that parcel of land. So Prince, essentially his testimony uh, or his oath to Burwell becomes the way how they help solve this uh, land dispute in July 1836. Okay, Natalie, who's next in our list of famous Black Britfordians? So another interesting uh, individual who makes his way up to Brantford at one point is Henry Maxfield. So Henry Maxfield was born in Africa and he was captured by slave traders and around the age of 12 he lands in Baltimore and so he ends up spending his time there and he is sold to a plantation in Maryland. Okay, so then if he's in Maryland, how long is he actually a slave for? So he's actually there for over 40 years uh, in that area and sold to around three different owners. And so that's when he makes his break for freedom. And what ends up happening is that he starts to navigate the Underground Railroad. And so he essentially starts remembering in his memoir, because we actually kind of have a little bit of a record of... Uh, his sort of like his testimony about how he helped follow along uh, the Quaker carriages as well. So he gets to Rochester and he boards the Chief Justice boat and on there is actually a Captain Rollins and Rollins actually sort of takes a liking to him and Maxfield actually works on the boat for two seasons. From there, he goes to Thornbury near Owen Sound, and he's told by local settlers, you should go to Bradford or London, where you can find plenty of your people. Okay, so what does Henry Maxfield choose? Bradford or London? He does choose Bradford, and so he gets to a farm just outside of Bradford, where he sort of starts working with a Mr. Daniel House. But... Mr. House was not a doctor, but <laughs> he was a farmer and uh, he was actually kind of pro-sentiment of what the southern states and their views on slavery, so not the best situation. So Maxfield was like, screw you, I'm getting out of here and I'm going to Buffalo. So he goes back to the states and actually enlists in uh, the Union Army. Okay, so does he actually end up fighting with the Union Army? Yeah, it does. It's crazy. From Brantford to the Union Army, who would have thought? Uh, so he ends up enlisting and he's one of the 127 volunteers out of a 1,100 uh, black soldier like uh, recruit amount. And so essentially he becomes involved in a number of battles and one of the most uh, notable being the Battle of Petersburg in Virginia. So there he is, he's, all, he's fighting and everything, but then he ends up getting injured. So he ends up uh, hurting his left foot and his left leg really badly. And so he ends up being discharged, but he becomes compensated. So he gets $600 bounty and then uh, $400 additionally uh, at the time of his discharge. 
So on April 27, 1888, the Brantford Weekly Expositor publishes his story at the age of 91 when he was asking for a pension. One man who attacked him with a scythe gave him a terrible scar on the shoulder, was actually brought before Chief Police Magistrate Wames and sent to the penitentiary for a long period of time, dying before his term was finished. So essentially, he justifies his experiences in Brantford, stating that he was never overcome by a white man, nor cullied in Brantford. Wow, Natalie, it's kind of like interesting that there's many early black Brantfordians that contributed to the community. But how important was like Brantford in terms of the whole Underground Railroad? What was that like? That's a great question. So for some people who don't know, like the Underground Railroad was actually not a formal railroad. <laughs> it was uh, sort of like a network of people and places that allowed safe passage uh, for slaves escaping to come up to Canada to find their freedom. But uh, some of the real hot spots on the Underground Railroad were um, places like Windsor, you had London, Buxton, Lucan, Chatham, all these places were really crucial to that. And then, so there's some uh, sources that sort of uh, pull Brantford into that and tie it into that history. So uh, maybe certain churches, certain houses. Uh, but if some, I would say that after doing a little bit of research, you can see that Brantford's not formally on that Underground Railroad map, but I would say that we had a crucial role in helping slaves find their freedom, as you can tell with a bunch of the early black settlers who were here. Um, but of course, uh, early Canada wasn't always like this safe haven. Uh, in fact, it was still pretty racist. In fact, Brantford definitely had and was known for having that sort of uh, hostile tract, uh, which is important to note. But um, getting back to the navigation point too, uh, one point that I found was interesting is that coming up the uh, Grand River, which helps uh, slaves navigate north, uh, some Tuscarora Baptists actually uh, helped people uh, navigate up the Grand, Grand River and they were involved in uh, people navigating the Underground Railroad. Um, but another part of uh, the Underground Railroad and anti-slavery was abolitionists. And so abolitionists were sort of like your anti-slavery people uh, and wanted to abolish the slave trade. And some early abolitionists in Brantford uh, include like George Brown. So he founded the Anti-Slavery Society in Canada and he owned Bull Park Farm. Uh, you also had William Cochran, who was also anti-slavery. And so it's really interesting that there was that sentiment kind of occurring in Brantford as well in the 19th century. Hiram Wilson, a known abolitionist for Upper Canada and specifically southwestern Ontario, also visited Brantford. In fact, one time in Oberlin, Ohio, an abolition hotspot, he was like to the missionary William Raymond, Hey, come on up to Upper Canada with me and join my troop of teachers. So Raymond eventually came to Brantford and taught at the black school, teaching children and adults on the Sabbath. Okay, so obviously there's a growing black community in Brantford. They have to be going to church somewhere, right? Yes. So in 1835, the Society of Colored Methodists gets formed in this in the town. So for thinking too, right? Like 1833 is when Burwell did his map, and then two years later, the society forms. And so they became really influential in establishing the Drake Memorial uh, British Episcopal Church, which is located at uh, 165 Murray Street. And so they also, the society also helped establish a school in Brantford. So it was a black school because obviously they were segregated from uh, the white school. But it was actually recorded at one point that the standards of education uh, was better at the black school versus like the settler uh, schools in town. And also, if we're thinking around this time too, the Mohawk Institute is opening. So it's a really interesting moment for uh, schooling uh, in the community. And so essentially, uh, a lot of, while this uh, community was growing, uh, the expositor was still recording uh, immense moments of racism and conflict as well. Okay, so there was obviously early uh, black 
arts and culture scene in Brantford. So the expositor probably had something to say about that, right? So what uh, the church had an influence in as well was promoting that. Uh, so there was actually a troupe called the O'Banion Jubilee Singers. And so the O'Banion Jubilee Singers were named after uh, Peter O'Banion. And so he was a escape slave who ran from Kentucky and him and his wife lived in Brant uh, Ward. And they do donated land which helped build the frame uh, of the original church on the northeast corner of uh, Murray and Dalhousie Street. Okay, so we all know that Granford has some crazy wild stories. So we're about to descend into probably the crazy and wildest story in Branford's history involving some of our Black Brantfordians, and it involves the John Anderson case. So Natalie, tell us about John Anderson. Who is this guy? So John Anderson was born in Missouri around 1831. His mother was owned by Moses Burton, who was a tobacco farmer and tradesman. And then his father was a steward on a steamer. Uh, but when he was born, he was known as Jack Burton because he would have taken his uh, slave owner's last name, as was common for the time. Uh, but you know what? Once he came to Canada, and uh, as we'll see with the legal case he was involved in, uh, he changed his name so many times. He went. He was known as William Jones, uh, William Anderson, and then kind of as we know him as John Anderson. And so what ends up happening is that he ended up working on uh, plantations as a young man in the States. And then he ended up courting uh, a woman from another plantation named uh, Maria Tomlin. And so he would go and visit her as he sort of moved around and as she moved around. And, uh, but uh, his slave owner was not too pleased with what he was doing and became more restrictive. And then John was like, whatever. And he ended up escaping. So it's day three of his escape. John was traveling in the daytime, but ran into Seneca Diggs, a farmer who was walking home to his farmhouse with his four slaves and his son. Diggs asks Anderson if he had his pass. Then, all of a sudden, Anderson flees, where Diggs orders his slaves to go and chase him. Okay, so what happens with the chase? So, Anderson ends up being cornered by Diggs' slaves, and so he gets encircled by them, but then they see that he's got a knife, and so that sort of scares them, and then he is able to sort of um, keep running, and then he kind of circles back, I guess, and he ends up going through a fence, and then lo and behold, around the corner was Seneca Diggs and his son, and then what ends up happening is that, as will be later quoted in the case, he dashes against Diggs with his open knife and essentially stabs him. Uh, but also kind of like in this form of self-defense, but the details are kind of foggy when it comes to recollect. Uh, but he ends up getting away, and Diggs is sort of hanging out there with a stab wound, but uh, later with the case, uh, they start to say, well, how many times was Diggs stabbed? Was he stabbed once? Was he stabbed twice? But Anderson um, gets out of there and he makes his way to Canada in one of the most craziest and most adrenaline pumping moments of his life. A couple days later, Diggs starts to suffer severely from the stab wounds. On October 11th, 1853, Diggs passed and Howard County went into an uproar, offering a reward for capturing Anderson. Okay, so how does Anderson escape from the deep south to the north and then on to the great white north? Yeah, so he's got to go because the slave captors are hot on his trail. So he crosses the Mississippi River in a stolen boat and he makes his way to Illinois. And then with the help of some abolitionists, he crosses the river and he makes his way to Detroit. And then he, like they're still hot on his trail and he's knowing that this is going on. So he ends up with the help of like the Underground Railway makes his way to Canada and so Windsor and Chatham area. And so what's also important is that he actually enrolls in a 
uh, escape slave school that was founded by Henry Bibb, uh, who was uh, a man who also started the voice of the fugitive, which is an important um, uh, abolition newspaper and also Bibb was an escape slave himself. So uh, Anderson hears that they're on his trail again, even though he's in Canada, and he makes his way to Chatham and he changes his name again. So the year is 1858 and Anderson eventually settles for buying a house in Caledonia. However, he ends up bragging about the stabbing and how he made it out alive. I mean, it is a pretty cool tale, but one of the slaves in Canada that he ends up telling the story to ended up getting into a quarrel with Anderson. So that slave tells the Onondaga magistrate and he's like, oh my God, Anderson is here in Brant County. Remember William Matthews, the crazy Irishman who was mayor? Well, in 1859, he gets a magistrate assigned to him by John A. Macdonald. So the Onondaga magistrate tells William Matthews, who was justice of the peace at the time, that Anderson was in town. And, of course, about the award, which was $1,000 to capture him. Matthews was like, heck yeah, I'll catch him and send one of my guys gunning. Okay, so does Matthews actually catch him then? So Matthews ends up sending his sheriffs out to go and arrest him. And so Anderson, living his new Canadian life, was topping syrup and he ends up getting arrested. And so Matthews interrogates him and detains him in the Brantford jail. Uh, and what ends up happening is that they let the uh, Diggs family know that Anderson is in Brantford. And the reason why that was significant was because the fugitive slave law was still at works in the states. And so that law basically allowed for slaves who had escaped or who were fugitives um, to be returned back to their plantation owner um, once they escaped. And so that was a massive piece of legislation that caused a lot of friction. Uh, between the northern and the southern states. So basically, if Anderson was extradited to the states, uh, he would be subject to that law and obviously Missouri penalties. So the Diggs family sends an agent to Brantford, but this guy gets held up in Detroit, so he lets the jail know he'll be there on Monday. But it was too late because Anderson was free two hours before the telegram arrived. Yay, Anderson's free! So why was he released exactly? So it's not really clear why he was initially released. It probably could just have been uh, the amount of time he was actually in jail without like the sufficient evidence uh, that he actually killed Diggs and also that there was a large amount of abolitionist pressure on Matthews. So they were basically being like, why the heck is he handling the case like this? And so the media, the industrial media essentially started picking this up. And so uh, one newspaper, like The Globe, George Brown, who founded the Anti-Slavery Society, uh, he was really um, interested in this case, I guess, or and pushing The Globe's coverage of it. And it was also the perfect time for him to pressure John A. McDonald, who was the attorney general at the time, being like, why the heck is Matthews handling the case like this? Get your man in line, McDonald. So it was like this big ideological battle uh, between these two about the fate of Anderson and if he would be extradited. Also, John Scoble, uh, who was a notable abolitionist, he's in that really cool painting in the National Portrait Gallery, uh, he actually was coming to Brantford the minute he heard about Anderson's possible extradition and he was trying to get involved and basically help Anderson and his lawyer out. Anyways, Anderson vanishes for the foreseeable future, but then someone tells Matthews that Anderson's in Simcoe. So Matthews wanted to get him tried in Brantford because he was like, screw Simcoe, there's some moolah associated with his case. Let's bring him to Brantford. So Matthews ends up hiring a Brantford police officer named Richard Yoward to go get him and put him in the Simcoe jail so that he can be transferred back to Brantford. Okay, so how does the transfer go from Simcoe to Brantford? So when Anderson had been living in Simcoe, he managed to get acquainted with that black community and before he was arrested, obviously. But what happens is that the night before his transfer, 
uh, the black community sort of rallies and they try to free Anderson from the jail. Uh, but they weren't successful, however, they ended up helping the transfer from Simcoe to Brantford and sort of riding along uh, the side of um, Anderson's transfer because um, American officers were hiring Canadian police officers to essentially help them uh, capture these escaped slaves and bring them back to the states where that fugitive slave law um, would be enacted. So they didn't want that to happen to Anderson. Okay, so what happens when Anderson gets to the Brantford jail then? So Matthews got him in his grasp again and essentially uh, Matthews decides to sort of think about holding an extradition hearing. And so why that was sort of an option was because John A. McDonald was kind of giving Willie, uh, Willie Matthews a little bit of a sprinkle of advice every now and then because they were actually pals in that conservative party. And so McDonald uh, was essentially like capitalizing off of that. Okay, so how does this hearing go in Brantford? It's day one. William C. Baker testifies. He's a Missouri carpenter and he knew Anderson. He was like, Diggs only had one cut in his right side. Day two, Thomas Diggs, the other son of Diggs, who was not at the stabbing, but he was able to describe the build of his father. Ben Diggs, the son who was there, did testify, as well as J.A. Holliday, who was a Howard County lawyer. And finally, Phil, one of the Diggs slaves who chased Anderson, provided an affidavit. Okay, so now that Brantford's making headlines, what's the media saying about us? Ooh, they were spicy! Man, they actually reported that, uh, like literally word for word, that by the order of the ruffian Mr. Matthews, uh, Mr. John A. McDonald's Brantford entertainer, how crazy, uh, the poor fellow was at his arrest, so that being Anderson, loaded with irons and has now suffered a rigorous incarceration of nearly two months. The Sarnia Observer too, so back to Canada, they were like, wow, the Anderson extradition case is the most spiciest and craziest thing to ever happen in Canada since the burning of the parliament buildings. So essentially, uh, we're now like around October 1860. Remember, 1853 uh, is when uh, Anderson scuffed digs. Um, this is now getting to be an international concern and, and it's starting to rev up. And so what ends up happening is the U.S. State Department asked their British ambassador in Washington by the name of Lord Lyons to go to England and essentially get Anderson's extradition. So the British Embassy sent the request to London, and the Governor General of Canada at the time, Sir Edmund Head, was told to return Anderson, the man of colour, to Missouri. Okay, so who's helping Anderson out with his defence? So, speaking of your beverage, Freeman was Anderson's lawyer. So, and, uh, Anderson's lawyer, Freeman, was actually in correspondence with uh, John A. McDonald about the case. He was like, this is what's going on, like, you are the Attorney General, I know this isn't your shtick, but we don't want um, this poor man to be extradited. Uh, and also, John A. was like, well damn, I'm getting part of the heat from this, so maybe I should uh, try and help this case out a little bit. But he was like, we should completely ignore the law by the fact that he might have actually killed someone. But, uh, Freeman, why don't you uh, apply or suggest a habeas corpus? A habia what now? <laughs> Latin, a habeas corpus. So it essentially allows for a writ uh, requiring a person under arrest to be brought before a judge or a court, uh, especially to help secure the person's release unless lawful grounds are shown for their detention. Okay, so where are these lawyers making their arguments? Is that happening here in Brantford? Nope, time to go to Toronto. So they head up to the Queen's bench in Toronto, so it's Anderson and everyone involved in his case, 
And so they go to speak with basically the Judge Judies of uh, the time, who were Chief Justices Robinson, McLean, and Burns. So they're essentially going for the big Judgment Day in December 1860. And also, uh, there were a lot of black people in the streets because they were ready to hear what the verdict was. And they were, like, they, it was a really crazy day. Noon came. Anderson enters the room. So he's ready to sort of hear his fate. So first up, uh, Judge, uh, Chief Justice Robinson walks up and he's like, okay, well, basically this case rests on to the point at which we will recognize Missouri slave laws. He's also like, we also have to recognize the Webster-Ashburton Treaty, which basically was a treaty that talked a little bit about um, border issues between the settler nations of Canada and the U.S., so he was recognizing that. And also, he was basically saying that because um, Anderson didn't have a pass, Diggs was acting in the legal authority of the state by chasing him, and that Anderson killed a person who was acting on uh, the state's legal authority. So basically saying that he should be extradited, and this should be deferred to a Missouri um, judge which would probably end up in a summary trial or a execution and or a lynching basically. So then McLean stands up. And so McLean was like, well, Phil, his affidavit basically confirmed that Anderson wielded the knife that essentially killed Diggs. But he ended up agreeing with Anderson in the end because he's like, doesn't matter, slavery is evil. So. Good on you, McLean. So then it all sort of kind of rests with Burns' decision. So Burns steps up and like the crowd's already roaring, uh, but he was like, even though Canada is anti-slavery, we're not anti-murder. So that didn't end too well. So Freeman, Anderson's lawyer, was like, what the heck? We're gonna appeal. But then things start to change again. John Scoble, the famous abolitionist whose letter was read in the case in Toronto, also tied in the British Foreign and Anti-Slavery Society, where they started advocating in Britain and gaining attention to the case. So the Brits were like, WTF, Canada, your decision sucks, and abolition is super important, so why are you being so dumb? Let this guy go! And then flexing their imperial stance, they were like, this is positively un-British. So one British dude, Edwin James, gave the society a hand by justifying to the British courts that the habeas corpus could also be applied in Britain because, technically, classic, they thought everyone was British in Canada and they were like, well, ta-ta, let's bring Anderson to England and try him here. So then James makes his case in Britain and essentially the reason why they wanted to bring the Anderson case to Britain was because abolition was in full swing and they're like, well, this would make us look good. And so then the judges were like, yeah, sure, okay, bring them here. But it wasn't that simple because then Britain started having this identity crisis about the case and was like, well, should we rethink the Webster-Ashburton Treaty? How do we deal with our colonies when they're being little brats? How can we elevate our superiority complex in this Anderson case with the whole thought of abolition itself? Ah! So what about our Canadian sovereignty? What is Canada saying about this? So Canada is like, why is Britain always being an arse? What happened to responsible government? And so the entire time that this is happening and that everyone's sort of like, who's gonna do what case and whatnot, Anderson had to go back to the, he was in the Brantford jail because they couldn't keep him in Toronto. But anyways, in the States too, they're like, what the hell is going on? And so they had a Buffalo newspaper who was also like to the extent saying that the refusal to return Anderson was causing complete Southern dissatisfaction. So what Freeman does is that he's like, okay, time for another habeas corpus. So do they get the habeas corpus? Yes. 
It's February 1861, the time for the case. Freeman gets the chance to do it in Canada. They were like, screw the British, we're going to do it here. So Freeman's argument goes like this. Your Honor, there was insufficient murder evidence for Canadian standards and that the Prisoner's Act has to be judged by Canadian law. The Missouri laws? No thanks. Anderson was defending his liberty when he struck Diggs, not murdering him. Also, Missouri never even really charged him for murder. So for extradition cases, there sort of had to be like this double law portion, essentially. So the crime had to be recognized in both states. And then if it was recognized, then you would be extradited. Then Henry Eccles, who was representing the Crown, was like, they're being way too emotional and we can't ignore the law. Okay, so how does this all end? It's killing me. Oh my God, Nathan. Anyways, here's the kicker. So it all comes back to Brantford. Basically, because Matthews issued his original warrant for Anderson's arrest on the fact that he feloniously and maliciously did kill Seneca Diggs, the fact that he said kill and not murdered and basically worded that warrant in a weird faulty way, it didn't say that Anderson actually murdered Diggs. So Matthews basically screwed up the entire case and the fact for Anderson's extradition, so Anderson didn't have to be extradited. Oh my god, Matthews. Classic Bramford scrub. At least it for, was for a good cause this time. And didn't Matthews become mayor again after that? Yeah, how cringeworthy. Anyways, Anderson was free to go and uh, the day when he was released, he sort of goes out into the streets and it's in Toronto and all of his black friends and community members that he was a part of were there, including some of those who uh, transferred him from Simcoe to Brantford. So a little tie in there. And uh, John Scoble, that abolitionist, was also there. And so Anderson goes on to lead this life of advocacy uh, against slavery. And so he uh, goes to England and then so he goes to Liverpool, but then apparently he was supposed to set sail for Liberia in uh, 1862. So he might have gotten on this ship, he might have jumped ship, he might not have made it to Liberia, or he might have made it to Liberia. No one really knows. He sort of, like classic Anderson, vanishes into thin air. So that's the John Anderson case and its connections to Brantford and also a little bit of the black history of our town as well. So thank you so much for joining us this week, but join us next week for our season finale of Brant History Happy Hour. Cheers.